Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so throughout this lecture, uh, the, the whole course, right? So far, we, when we talk about database either as a user, right? So as, or as a potential developer of the kernel, right? We, we always think about database as something running, yeah, essentially on a single machine, right? So, so the problem is that in real world, that's not really how database works, right? So in, in real world, when you have a petabyte of data, right? When you have a huge data warehouse. So it's often the case that multiple machines are going to communicate with each other and they together form a single database systems. So in this lecture, we are going to look at them, right? So we are going to talk about three different aspects of that. We are going to continue what we had in the last lecture to talk about distributed commit, right? So when you have multiple machines and there's one call in there say, okay, here's a one red dollar transaction. I want to commit that, right? So, and how can we design the commit protocol for that? And then we are going to talk a little bit about distributed query processing, right? When you have your data set being partitioned onto multiple machines, uh, how can you really kind of coordinate between them to finish a single SQL query. For example, you have maybe multiple universities, uh, you have a student table contains all the students in all the universities. And then ask you say, okay, find me some student with ID equals to five, right? In this case, it's kind of easy, right? Because every single university can actually do processing independently like on their own, right? How can we make that happen? So how can we do a distributed query optimization? And also how can we distribute query processing, right? And then we are going to talk about another type of distributed data uh, systems. Uh, instead of having a distributed database, you can actually uh, weaken the guarantee you have to your user and you can end up with something similar to a distributed key value store, right? We are going to put all of these three different aspect of a distributed data system together. And that is what we are going to talk about today. So before we start, right? So just to uh, calibrate the expectation, right? So like all of this, each of these topic could be their own book, right? So there's no way we are going to uh, go into detail for either of those, right? So the reason we talk about this, actually for two reasons, right? The first one, we want to make sure you understand uh, this is a functionality that database is able to provide for you. Uh, when you go to the real world, when you go to the real job, right? When you build your database system, whenever you get stuck to say, okay, a single machine really, it's really slow, right? So all my database system is actually very slow, right? So remember there are distributed functionalities provided by the database. And then that's your pointer to say, okay, maybe I should look at different distributed solutions, right? Don't be scared by doing that. So that is actually the main purpose of today's lecture to make sure you are aware there's such functionality provided by modern data ecosystems. Uh, and second is also show you the challenge, right? For you to understand for each of this, uh, it's actually not easy or not trivial to build such a system, right? Then together we can appreciate the complexity of modern data ecosystems. So that's the purpose of today. Okay, so let's continue what we had uh, from Wednesday about distributed commit. So here's the scenario, right? So assuming you want to build a price line, right? Uh, you actually have a kind of a, essentially building a coordinator, right? So you are, can talk to a database, contains information about hotel, contains information about flight, about, uh, about like, I mean, also book cars, right? So, and then I have one global transaction for so example, user comes in to say, okay, I want to build a bundle out of this three. I want to book a hotel, I want to book a flight, I want to book a car, right? So that's a single transaction. And then your coordinator is going to talk, talk to the hotel database. So say, okay, okay, so I want to book this hotel. You talk to the flight database and then you talk to the car database. And for each of these three, right? From the hotel database point of view, you are having one transaction just for the hotel database. So what is the problem here, right? If you are building such a service? Well, there are a lot of problems, but we are going to look at one of them. And uh, that is when you want to enforce automaticity on the global transaction. 
you want to make sure uh, only two possible scenarios can happen. Either the whole global transaction is being executed, all of these changes being reflected, or none of the changes are reflected in the database. So the challenge here is that even if for each database system, hotel DB, flat, flat DB, right? Even each of them give you automaticity, them come together doesn't necessarily give you distributed automaticity. That's a very simple example, right? So what if uh, you are running into three different transactions, but uh, the, the, the car database fail in the middle? Right, then what would you do, right? In this case, even though each of the small transactions, the local transactions uh, are automatic, right? So like, like, like hotel DB, flight DB, they succeeded, but the car DB failed, right? Yeah, they are, automa uh, they are automatic, right? And then, and there's automaticity, right? So, and then to come together, do not give you the global automaticity simply because if you look at the global transaction, uh, the only part of the large transaction succeeded, right? And that is something we want to avoid. How can we coordinate between different um, databases when I want to do a global commit? So of course, we need to design a protocol for distributed commit. And if you think about the high level idea from this motivating example, the solution may sound kind of not trivial, but very natural, right? So essentially, you can partition the whole thing into two different phases. In phase one, you call in there and say, okay, so now I want to commit this global transaction. Everyone just vote, right? What do you think? Do you think I can commit, right? If everyone says yes, yeah, please, all the changes in my local site are already in, you go commit, right? And then the coordinator is going to collect all those information. And if everyone says yes, is going to make a decision, the decision phase to say, okay, now everyone commit, and then I will let everyone know about it. So what is the problem here, right? This seems to be a very simple uh, solution, right? So the fundamental problem here is that the coordinator could fail, the worker could fail, all they could, or maybe all of them fail, right? And they can fail at any time. Whenever you are building a protocol, Right? You need to make sure you take into consideration all those potential failure cases. And that is something that we are going to play with today. Okay, now let's put in more details into this protocol, right? So let's say you have a coordinator, it's the scene in the middle, and you have two workers, for example, you have worker one, you have worker two. And from the top to the bottom, right? So that is your timeline. Okay, so that's single arrow, right? So it's a, I mean, it's a time. And let's put in more details into the protocol. So for the first phase, the voting phase, so coordinator going to ask what's, uh, going to ask the worker, um, can I commit, right? And the worker can say no. Worker can say, okay, I don't think so, right? I failed, whatever, right? Um, but we want to enforce additional constraint uh, and you will see why that is important is that if a worker says, so if, if a worker doesn't say no in this phase, they will not say no in the next stage. So that's a constraint that we want to have. That is, after the worker says yes, even though the worker fail, we should have enough amount of information uh, to recover it, right? So, 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 so why do we want this? So the thing we want to avoid is some worker says yes, a coordinator make a decision to say, oh, everyone commit. And then another worker comes in, okay, by the way, I just failed, right? I lose all my information. I actually want to change my answer. So clearly that is something very hard to do from the coordinator perspective, maybe even impossible to handle, right? So essentially when the worker says yes, we want to make sure they have all the information to make sure no matter what happened, they will continue to say yes in the future. They will not change their answer back. Okay, so how can we do that, right? So on Wednesday, we talk about how to use login to make that happen, right? Each worker also take log. And in the second phase, the decision phase, right? If all the workers are okay, the coordinator will commit. If one worker says, okay, by the way, I'm, I'm not done. Oh, it's not done, right? But by the way, like my, my local transaction aborted, right? Or I failed, whatever, right? So the coordinator will say, okay, then everyone abort, 
So that's our simple protocol. So let's look at how this protocol work, right? So at the very beginning, when the coordinator want to commit, right, it will actually put one record called prepare into its log and going to flash it, okay? So essentially, whenever you see this record in your log file, it means that the coordinator has already started the process of distributed commit, okay? So that's very important. And then the coordinator will say, okay, send a message to worker one saying that, okay, you prepare for distributed commit and then send a prepare message for worker two, right? You prepare. And after you receive this prepare message, assuming you are worker one, right? What you are going to do is going to, okay, look at your local transaction and then try to store all the information in your log such that even if you fail, I can still recover your, your state, right? Whenever that is done, you put in a record in your log called ready, okay? So semantic as follows. Whenever you flash this record to your hard drive, your local transaction will not ask for a bot anymore. Even if you fail afterwards, someone put a plug of worker one, as long as ready T is in the log flush to, to, uh, to the hard drive, it means that I have enough amount of information to fully recover your state such that I will not abort this local transaction. Okay. And on Wednesday, we actually talk about how to do that using uh, red hat logs, right? So whenever that is true, it's flush the record ready T to, 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 to the hard drive. And then if it is okay, it's going, to, it, it's going to return to the coordinator. Okay, well, I'm fine, right? So I'm, I'm okay with commit. Similarly, worker two do the same thing and then send back a message, okay. And then that bring the coordinator to the voting phase. Essentially the coordinator will say, okay, so now everyone says, okay, let me flash the commit record to the uh, like to my log and also flash it out. I put yeah, put a command record in my log and flash it out. So that's my decision. I decided to commit. And then I send the message to each of the other workers, say, okay, so you guys commit. And each worker going to commit, flash out the record, and done. Okay. So this is a very simple protocol. As you can see, there's only actually three rounds of message passing. The coordinator inform all the workers, you guys prepare, and each, and each worker flush out the log, flush out the, like, uh, the ready record, get back the result, and then coordinator going to commit, tell all the workers, okay, commit. So this is what would happen when all the workers are okay, okay? So this sounds very simple. What will become interesting is you imagine at some point, some of this, maybe all of the, 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 the three players in the picture, or maybe some of them are going to fail. And there are so many different ways the, the system can be done, right? So then let's try to look at some of them systematically. So assuming you have this, and let's assume magically all the workers, sorry, that all the players, including the coordinator, going to fail at the same time. Right. Why, why could that happen? For example, someone put the plug of the whole data center, right? So all the machines are down at the exact same time, suddenly, right? So let's assume that is the case. And let's assume the system fail at this point. That is after the coordinator flash the record prepare to the hard drive, and then the system just is done. What would happen at this moment, whenever you restart your data center. Whenever you restart your data center, what would you see, right? So all you are going to see in the log file or the coordinator is a record called prepare T. From that, you will actually know, ah, actually, before I go down, uh, before I went down, right? So my coordinator was trying to commit the transaction T and the process already started, but then I'm done, 
right? So then what's going to happen is the coordinator essentially going to abort this transaction. It's going to put a special record called abort into the log and then inform each of the worker, okay, guys, abort T. I don't care about what, what you decide locally, abort that. Okay, that's simple. What if the system crashes here, right? So after the coordinator send out the prepare message, right, to each of the worker, and this and this system is done. When we restart your system, what would you see, right? Well, in this case, the same thing, right? All you can see is a log file contains a record called prepare. The same thing, right? So you are going to the coordinator going to tell all the workers, okay, about about it, okay. I know we started this process of committing it, but then we are all done. You guys about that. What about here? After worker one putting a ready record into the hard drive, and the system crashes. In this case, the same, because from the calendar perspective, when you restart, you are seeing the same thing. I only see a prepared T, right? So, so in fact, my, my, my recovery strategy should be the same. I just tell all the worker, okay, I don't care what you have about. The same here, right? From the calendar perspective, nothing changes when you restart. You only have a log file with a single record of prepared T, everyone about. What do you have here? Once, er once the coordinator collect all the information from all the workers, write down the commit record, make the decision, whole thing stop. In this case, we will restart the whole data center. If you look at the log file of coordinator, you are going to see the commit record. It actually means that, okay, it means two things. First one, I already made the decision is commit. And second, all the workers, they already have all the information they need to recover flashed to their hard drive. Because otherwise they will not reply okay to me. And then otherwise I will not make the decision. So essentially the coordinator is sure that I'm able to ask all the workers to commit because they have all those information. In this case, we will restart. The coordinator will actually tell all the workers, okay, guys, commit, okay? We were trying to commit this transaction. I don't care whether you receive my message or not, right? Because I don't know when I get done, right? Just commit. If you have already committed, great. If you haven't, commit. We are going to commit it, okay? Similarly like this, right? If you fail at this point, the coordinator also going to talk to worker one when it started, okay, commit. And the worker will say, okay, I already committed, but I know you don't know, right? So then it does nothing. And worker two is like, okay, so I haven't committed, right? Uh, you tell me to commit, I commit. So this is actually what's going to happen when the whole system is done, right? So when the whole data center is just, all the machines are done at the exact same time. The whole thing can become a little bit more complex when you think about the cases, for example, when worker fails, right? So for example, uh, after the coordinator send the prepare message to worker one, worker two, and worker two fail. Here's what could happen. Well, in this case, worker one knows nothing. If you think about worker one, worker one don't know worker two is done, right? Worker one going to follow the protocol, going to prepare, vote okay, and then, the coordinator are going to wait for worker two for some period of time. And then the coordinator are going to realize worker two is done because I pin worker two, worker that doesn't get back to me, it's done. So I'm, something happened, right? And then coordinator are going to actually abort the whole transaction, right? I, I, like worker one was okay, but worker two is not there anymore, right? So I'm going to abort T. I'm going to actually send the abort message to worker one. Worker one going to abort this transaction. And imagine after, uh, yeah, so and imagine this case, right? And uh, both worker prepare and also push ready into the, like, into the hard drive. 
and then worker two stop. In this case, worker one do the same, right? Okay. And then coordinator going to wait for worker two, but I didn't hear back. I will bot, I will bot. Okay. But what if at some point worker two get back to life? In this case, when you recover worker two, you are actually going to see, ah, okay, so there's a ready T here. I was in the middle of trying to commit T. I don't know whether I told the coordinator my, my, my opinion or not. So I'm going to tell coordinator again. I say, okay, I vote okay. By the way, I was done, but now I, 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 I vote okay. Let me know what to do. And then in this case, right, the coordinator already make decision because there's a ball T in the log. And the coordinator is going to say, okay, it's great that you're back to life, but it's too late, or bot. Okay. And what if the failure happened here? Well, it's, just, it's kind of interesting, right? So after I vote it, after I say, okay, okay, I, I, I can commit it, and then I'm done. In this case, from the coordinator perspective, you already receive all the votes, right? Then of course, you are going to make a decision, everyone commit, right? And then I'm going to tell worker one, you commit. And then what happened to worker two? Right, in this case, worker two is done. Like even the coordinator tell worker two, commit, commit, commit. I mean, worker two will not hear that. Only after worker two get back to life, it look at the local log file, it's only C ready T, right? From worker two's perspective, it has no information to, the, to see whether it's already sent the okay message or not. So it's going to send it again. And then Colin are going to look at the local file to say, ah, actually we decided to commit it, you commit and the worker to commit. Okay, so this is how this distributed protocol works. So as you can see, the, 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 the fundamental problem is whenever some worker fail, other worker do not know, right? So that's why you need to have a very carefully designed distributed protocol for this purpose. What if the system down here? After calling to tell everyone, commit, you're done. You'll get back to life. You look at your local log file, there's a ready T, you have no idea. You have no idea whether you send the, 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 the okay back or not. Even though you send, or, or, or also you, you, have already, or you, have, you have already received that, but you don't know when you, when you recover from failure. You say, okay, you say, okay, again, go and say, okay, commit. Okay, simple, right? So as you can see, it's very important for you to flash out the, re the ready record to the hard drive before you tell the coordinator anything. Otherwise it's very dangerous. So similarly, what would happen here? Coordinator tell our environment to commit and the worker to commit it, flash a record and then fail. Well, in this case, it's kind of simple. When you get back to life, you are going to see, ah, there's a commit record. I already committed T, I'm done, right? So I do not need to uh, tell the coordinator again that I voted okay, because I know I have already voted. Any questions at this moment? Okay. So now let's consider another phase, uh, like, like another case. What if the coordinator fail? So assuming the coordinator flash out the prepare T to the log, to hard drive, and then failed, worker one, worker two doesn't know. So here, the worker one is also going to periodically pin the coordinator to make sure it is still alive, right? And the communication channel is open. Assuming after a while, worker one realized, huh, coordinator is down. So I decided to just abort transaction T because coordinator is down. And then coordinator get back to life after that. And assuming at that moment, worker two knows nothing. Worker two pin coordinator and it got lucky, it just, Right, so, so the, for the whole period of calling this down, worker two doesn't know. And then calling to get back to life is look at the file to say, okay, I was trying to commit T 
So everyone vote. And in this case, worker two doesn't know worker one already voted. So it's going to do the same thing, going to prepare, right? Going to vote okay. And then on the other hand, the worker one will say, okay, I already bought this T. Coordinator, you will bought. Coordinator going to receive all the votes and see one about, decide about T and ask everyone to vote. Okay. So in this case, that need to talk to worker one because worker one already bought it. Right? Okay. What if the system fail here? You already collect the vote. Coordinator already make a decision. Then the system is done. Then the coordinator is done. Worker two or worker one are fine. In this case, when the coordinator gets back to life, it's going to look at a local log file to say, okay, I already made a decision. We decided to commit. Everyone commit. Okay. It's kind of pretty simple once you understand this. What if coordinator is done after it sends one message to one worker and then it's done? So when you restart the system, you look at a log record, you only see prepare T and commit T. You have no idea whether you have sent the message to worker one or not, because that's not my log. So I'm going to send the commit message to worker two, but also send the commit message to worker one. I'm going to send that twice to worker one. So from the worker one perspective, you also need to deal with that, right? Whenever the coordinator sends you two messages, right? Don't be surprised. Right, because second one might be the case that coordinator is done. Okay. So there's actually some other things that we haven't talked about. That is, what if the system fails during recovery? Right. So that is a very delicate thing, right? When we really design the system, you need to see, like assume even during recovery, I can fail again. Right. So that actually would make this very hard to do. Yeah, but given a careful thinking and design. That's actually possible, right? By following the kind of principle that we illustrated uh, in the lecture. So now we have the protocol. Let's try to understand how good it is or how bad it is. What is the performance? What is the cost? Because once you understand that, we can start to understand the question of whether we can do better. But before we ask ourselves whether we can do better, we need to define what is good. What is the thing we try to optimize? So what is the performance model for this? Well, there are many things, right? But the overly simplified version of this is that let's count how many messages that has been sent around between different machines, different players, and also what is the latency to commit a single uh, global transaction. So assuming you have one coordinator and n different workers, how many messages the coordinator need to send? In the worst case, well, not in the worst case, but, but the, when everyone is okay, right? So the coordinator needs to send the worker essentially two times n messages, right? I need to send n messages prepare, to one for each worker. Also, I need to send commit, one for each worker. How many messages the coordinator needs to receive, right? Now here is also n, right? Each worker needs to tell me the vote. If one can send a message concurrently to all the workers, what is the latency? Like assuming every single message requires time t to reach the, the worker, and assuming I can broadcast at exactly the same time, what's the latency? Once the user say commit, and once your coordinator tell the user commit, how long that you need in between, right? So in this case, I need to wait at least three times t, right? So t is actually the time uh, for each single message to arrive, I need to wait at least three times t. Now we have this performance model. How many messages we are sending, what is latency? We can start to ask ourselves the question, can we do better? Can we decrease some of this? And what's the cost we are going to pay if you want to decrease some of this? So let me tell you an alternative protocol, uh, something called the linear two-phase commit. It actually works in an interesting way. So as you can see, now the coordinator is on the left-hand side. Your coordinator, you have worker one, worker two. Whenever the coordinator try to commit a global transaction, what you do is ask the coordinator to say, okay, you ask worker one. You don't ask all the workers. You ask worker one. Are you okay? I want you to commit. 
and the workaround is going to check. Okay, so I, I, I want to commit. Instead of talking to the coordinator, worker one tell worker two, are you okay? Right? So you have this linear structure. Coordinator asks worker one, worker one asks worker two, so on and so forth. When you reach the last worker, if everything is okay, you are going to get back to say, okay, I'm okay. I committed worker one, you commit. And worker one finally tell the coordinator, okay, everything is okay, you commit. This is an alternative protocol to deal with distributed commit, right? Instead of the coordinator talk to everyone, you have a linear chain over all the workers and ask them to talk to each other. What is the performance model here? So as you can see, right here, we are going to have those almost like peer-to-peer -peer propagation of messages. If everything goes well, if all the workers can commit, you are going to essentially have this case. From left to right, you are going to send the yes information, right? So say everything, oh, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. And then the last worker aggregate and then send it back the commit information, right? If some of the worker fail, right? You have yes, yes, yes. And then some worker say, okay, I cannot commit. Then you are going to also propagate the, the no information in two direction to make sure all the other worker abort. So this is the information flow. If you put it side by side with two-phase commit, right? In two-phase commit, in total, we need to send three N messages and we need to incur a latency of three times T, right? If you look at the linear two-phase commit, what is the number of messages that we need to send? In this case, it's actually two times n, right? Because I actually do a forward pass in my linear chain, and then I do a backward pass, right? So number of messages I need to send is two times n. You can see already smaller than two-phase commit. But what are the price that we need to pay, right? If you think about latency, I cannot have those like concurrent communication between coordinator and all the other workers anymore. Every single time I go one step of my information propagation, I need to wait T. In the forward pass, I need to wait N times T. In the backward pass, I need to wait N times T. So the latency is actually two N times T. If you put them side by side, so there's Literally, there's, there's no free lunch, right? If you do linear two-phase commit, you are sending fewer amount of messages, but you are incurring essentially higher latency. So, and there are a lot more in distributed commit, right? Essentially, we talk about the first two cases where the red one, right, is the coordinator. You talk to all the workers, that's one communication topology. You could have this linear case, right? Or you could have a hierarchical case. You can actually play with the optimal way all those workers and coordinators are talk to each other. So this actually work that would make the whole thing very, very interesting because you can have so many different ways to talk to each other. And for each of them, they have different profile in the sense of how many messages they send, also what is the latency. You can play with it. So, and here we just look at essentially two very simple examples. Okay, so that's about distributed commit. Before we move on to uh, query processing, uh, any questions? You know, any question that uh, just be uh, just speak up? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Could you go back to the slide where whatever uh, one worker fails, please? Uh, sure. Two phase commit, right? Oh, uh, yeah. One worker fail. Yeah. Fail when? When does? Uh, it later. <laughs> Here. Uh, no, later. Uh, later? Here? Um, no, even later. <laughs> okay, here. Yeah, I think this is late enough. Yeah. So <laughs> if now um, worker two stays dead for like two days and comes back to life, then um, is the coordinator still able to know what he should do? Yes, because committee is in the log. It's already flushed to disk. Okay, so what then it has to keep this lock essentially forever. Ah, okay, good question. Um, 
Yes, in this case, we are assuming that you need to keep, you, need to, you cannot, uh, okay. You cannot delete your log until you do a full checkpointing of the system, right? And when you do checkpointing, you are going to realize the worker tool is down, so I cannot really do checkpointing. My checkpointing will fail, right? But do you really realize this? Because coordinator is done by now with the protocol, right? Oh yeah, yeah, but but for example, uh, so we haven't talked about how to do distribute the checkpointing, right? So like assuming this is the case, and uh, the coordinator say, okay, I want to do checkpointing. I want to make sure I can remove my log file because it is getting too large. What would you do? I need to talk to all the worker to make sure they don't need me anymore, right? Then I can remove my log file. So there's another distributed protocol when you try to delete log. Right. I see. Okay. Thanks. Right. Right. So, 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 like, uh, like, uh, essentially, whenever you do anything, you need to ask other people. Coordinators will say, "Okay, can I delete this commit record?" Uh, to do that, I need to talk to all the worker to get a, a kind of an insurance, like that is, you will not need this anymore. Then I can delete that. Right. So, 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 so I cannot just delete that on my own. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Perfect. Yeah, and also when worker down 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 by two two days, I think IT is going to get a lot of calls and they are going to realize that. Right? Yeah, but uh, whenever you do checkpointing, you also have a distributed problem. Okay, cool. So any other questions? Um, I would be interested in yeah if um in the previous in the previous uh, failures we looked at because yeah. do we also what would happen in the, in the case of an network partition? That means if one of the workers is uh, basically separated by the network. So it doesn't really fail, but it just can't communicate with the, with the coordinator anymore. Oh, yeah. So, so essentially, that's very similar to, to this case, right? So here, worker two is done. Maybe either the network is broken, maybe the worker is done, right? But anyway, the coordinator will not hear back. I see. So basically, network partition is basically treated in the same way as if the machine itself went down. At least for this simplified example, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Cool. Any other questions? Okay. So yeah, distributed commit is very interesting. So and it's going to take a lot of time if you want to get a full picture. And there's a paper by Jim Gray and uh, Leslie Lampard when I was at Wisconsin <laughs> doing my PhD. I mean, that paper took us two weeks. Uh, to read and discuss yeah so it's, it has a lot of fun uh but here we just scratch the surface to make sure you know when you are doing this real commit you need to be careful and there's only one method you are going to remember today is you need to be careful okay how to be careful oh i mean if you really need to be careful uh there's not of thing to learn but don't take this for granted to say, ah, it's, it's, it is recommended easy. It's actually, it's, actually not, it's actually not easy, okay? So when you build a real thing, be careful, okay? Okay, so now let's switch gear to talk about distributed query processing. So, so far, when we think about database systems, right, we always think, okay, so there's a single CPU and there's a single hard drive, but the real world is actually more complex than that. Right. Remember this picture. We 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 look at this picture right after Easter, right? So this is what a database systems look like today. It's a whole rack of machines. I mean, it's actually small, very like very small system. Actually, it's it's, a, it's only a single rack, right? You have a rack of machines. You have multiple servers. You have half a terabyte of memory, right? Which is actually pretty small if you think about that. Uh, like today's, I mean, this is a couple years old now. I mean, today is like way larger than that. And every single machine can give you 1.5 terabyte of, of memory, right? So, I mean, giving you have like uh, multiple new nodes, right? So, yeah, so, and this is machine, right? So, all those servers are going to coordinate with each other to really host petabyte of data for you as a user. So, like, how does you do query processing? We don't have all those players, right? So that is something that we haven't talked about uh, so far. So let's try just scratch the surface to understand a little bit better. So there are multiple ways that all those machines can coordinate to answer a single query. 
And all of them is actually based on your assumption about what do they share. So you can think about each machine. So here each rectangle is each machine has three components. You have your CPU, you have your memory, and you have your storage. You could assume there, there is a shared memory among all those machines. You have distributed shared memory, right? So essentially all those memory pieces become a single pool of huge memory, right? If you, you build your distributed database in that way, you have a shared memory model. You could have a shared disk model, right? So assume you are building some cloud database, you have some distributed storage and all the machine access the same storage as if they are reading from the same hard drive, okay? So if you have that, uh, you have the shared disk model, right? Which is also very popular, especially given like uh, how large cloud storage has become, right? You can also assume each machine have their individual CPU, memory, and hard drive. And that gives you the shared nothing model, okay? So for each of this, you can actually have a, some very famous system to, to, like, like, like to do that, right? So in this lecture, we focus on shared nothing, okay? So our mentality model is we have multiple machines. Each machine have their own memory, have their own hard drive, and uh, they share nothing. They only be connected by the network. And you have a master node, and the master node is going to receive a query. And each worker contains a single machine database that can answer SQL queries. And the master worker is going to coordinate, going to do query optimization, do planning, concurrent control, logging, recovery. It is the master node's job. Okay. So how can we do query processing here? Before we talk about it, let's talk about why do we even need a distributed database? And then we are going to take a break. So first one, maybe the data is too large to fit into a single machine, right? And on, like on each machine, you, I mean, you can only connect that many hard drives, right? So maybe the data is too large for a single machine, so we need multiple machines. Maybe you are doing some computational intensive query, for example, a huge aggregation of all your data. Uh, you are bounded by your CPU. My single CPU is not fast enough, right? So I need to distribute that. I need all the worker to do the job concurrently. And the third one, which is often uh, one of the most important factor is when you have multiple machines, you have multiple hard drives, right? So think about how much aggregated IO bandwidth that you are getting. Because if you think about all the algorithms we are talking about in this course, right? So most of them actually IO bound, right? So we are bounded by how fast you can bring data from your hard drive to your memory. That is our key bottleneck. When you have, when you have two memory system and two hard drive, the aggregate bandwidth is going to double. When you have 100 machines, right? The aggregate IO bandwidth is going to be 100 times faster, right? When you are IO bound, adding each of those workers potentially will make your system much faster. So all of these are the reason we want to have multiple machines coordinate. And because of this, it also means that just distributing the, the, the workload to multiple machines, that doesn't necessarily make the whole thing faster because I need to be able to do computation concurrently. I need to be able to do IO concurrently, right? If all the machines wait for, wait, like wait for each other, maybe it gets slower, right? So that's something we need to be really careful about. So the basic idea is actually very natural, but not trivial. That is, uh, we have a large database. Let's partition it to each worker. Uh, and each worker only deal with its own partition. And whenever the master node receives a SQL query, it's going to translate that into a whole bunch of smaller SQL queries for each of the worker, and then uh, aggregate the result and then return to my user. So that is the basic idea. So the design goal of the system is to really achieve data transparency, is to make sure the user shouldn't know how the data is physically located. It doesn't matter how you partition your data, the SQL query I'm writing shouldn't change. I want to enable this level of data transparency for my user. I want to make sure all the distributed execution is also declarative.
from the user perspective. So this is ideally uh, what I want to achieve. I want to make sure even though the user are using a distributed database, she doesn't know about it. She's using the database as if they are all on a single machine. So that's my design goal. So of course, it's a very natural idea. But of course, you can think about the fundamental question is, OK, how should I partition my data? right? And given a partition strategy of my data, and given a query, how can I do query optimization? How can I do query execution? So now let's take a break. When we get back, we are going to talk a little bit about those fundamental questions. OK, so if you have any question, I'll be here to answer them. Yeah, just speak up. Um, and just for being curious, yeah. I wanted to know if um, what currently deployed uh, distributed databases look like. So that would be just maybe a just maybe an interesting question. For example, which uh, databases, which distributed databases are used in practice right now? Oh, there are so many of them. We are going to look at one example when we get back from the break. So there's a short demo about that. Uh, there are a whole bunch of those. I mean, most of the database you are going to buy from vendors, Oracle, like 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 Microsoft, uh, SQL Server, right? IBM, like DB2, and most of them are actually distributed. You you can deploy them to multiple machines. If you use all those databases on the cloud, like like a Snowflake, right? So that's actually inherently kind of distributed. Uh, you can also deploy that database on a single machine, right? So then uh, you have multiple processes. So most of the database you see today, if they are not distributed, they are parallel. They can run multiple instances on the same machine, right? So the, the question is really which database is single core, right? Uh, that gives you a SQLite. And the really basic, and even MySQL, you can you can deploy distributed way, right? So I think most of the database system that you see today can be deployed in a distributed way, actually. Yeah. Even for SQLite, I think there is some wrapper to make that distributed. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. So 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 the beauty is that if you want to build a distributed database, you can have a single core database on each machine, and you only build a coordinator. Right, so that's actually make that much easier. You can actually build some generic coordinator that works for most of the single core database. So that's why, like most of this, there are some extension to make them distributed. Yeah, makes sense. Yes, makes sense. Cool.
Okay, so let's continue. Yeah, so we talk about distributed database, right? So essentially each worker, right, you can think about them as their own database, right? And the master going to translate a large SQL query into a smaller SQL query for each of the worker and aggregate the result. So there's one fundamental question, right? So first one, how can you partition your data? And also how can you answer your, like, uh, like your query given a partition of your data, right? So there are so many ways that you can deal with this. So let's look at one example, right? So one way to deal with this is okay. So I have, for example, two relations are nice. Hmm. When I partition them, I put one on one machine. I, I, I make, like, like put R on worker one, I put S on worker two, okay? I put one table per machine. And then assuming the user want to say, ah, here's a query. I want to join R nice. I want to do some sub selection on R, sub selection on S. I join R and S by like a, like a natural join on attribute A. So think about if you are the coordinator, right? We, we will not talk about how to do this systematically, but if you are the coordinator, what would you do? And if I were the coordinator, I would say, okay, I would push down the selection. Yeah, I say, okay, worker one, you give me all the tuple in R where B equals one. I tell worker two, give me all the tuple in S where D equals to two, right? I push down all the selection, right? All the way from the join to each relation. And all of this can be done in parallel, right? Because they only concerns a single table. And they, as you can see, I can already get some speed up because I have two workers working on these two queries concurrently, right? If you uh, think about like in the ideal case, uh, how much IO bandwidth can you get, right? You are actually getting two times potentially, right? So this can be two times faster already, right? And then I have this small table, R prime and S prime as my result. And then I aggregate them. I say, okay, everyone send me the result. And then I will draw in that on my coordinator, this small drawing. That could be one way of doing distributed query processing, given this way that you partition your table. So what's the benefit? Well, for, for this case, right? So worker one, worker two can process two relations concurrently, which is good. And also if the result, this R prime and S prime are very small, the communication cost is very small, right? So it's much smaller than worker two copy the whole S to R and do the drawing locally. So what's the limitation of this? The limitation of this is it's very easy to see because if you put one relation per worker, I only have that many relations, right? What if I have a 1,000 workers about 10 relations, what can you do, right? So, and also what if a table doesn't fit in a single machine, maybe R is way too large, right? I have a couple billions of students, for example, right? So what can I do? So, and also as we will see, uh, queries that can be parallelized or distributed in this way, is actually pretty limited, okay? It's not often the case that if you do this type of partitioning, uh, you can get a speed up, right? So another way, actually the most pop one of the most popular way uh, to deal with this uh, is what people call horizontal partitioning. So the idea is very simple. So given a whole bunch of input relations, I put some of the row on some machine and some of the row on the other machine. For example, for relation R, Right, I have four tuples. I partition them into two different relations, R1, R2, right? I put R1 on worker one, I put R2 on worker two. Uh, also the same thing for S, right? I put uh, kind of uh, S1 on worker one, S2 on worker two. And then if you give me a query, for example, you want to join on, uh, on attribute A and assuming if I'm lucky, that is all my R and S are also partitioned based on A, okay? For example, I can do a hash partition. I can just calculate the hash value on attribute A. I partition the hash range, right? So I do hash partition on A, right? In this case, if you are the coordinator, what would you do? Well, you can actually ask worker one to do the join between R1 and S1. You can ask worker two to do the join between R2 and S2. And then you aggregate them, you do a union. As you can see, this could be very fast. 
because all those machines actually running those uh, running those query in concurrent way. If you are bounded by the I/O bandwidth from your hard drive, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. So 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 by some data movement, like uh, like uh, like bottleneck, like either the I/O right, the hard drive to memory, uh, or in modern database from the memory to to the register, right. So you are getting two times the aggregated bandwidth. And this one can actually scale, assuming you have hundreds of machines, right? So you can have hundreds of the small tables doing them concurrently and then you yield in the result, right? So this is kind of something uh, people often do in practice. When the result is very small, when T1 and T2 is very small, right? So this can be very fast because each machine doing their job independently and concurrently. So, but this is actually not that simple because it all depends on your query and also depends on how your data is being partitioned. And sometimes you may choose to replicate some of the tables if they're small. So let's look at three different cases. I want to do R join S on attribute A, okay? Assuming your, your, your partition strategy is that you do hash partition on relation R, you have R1 and R2 partitioned by the attribute A. And then if S is very small, I just replicate S. I just broadcast S to all the workers if it's very small. Right? So in this case, if you want to do R join S, you can actually, for, R, for worker one, you calculate R1 join S. For worker two, you calculate R2 join S. And then you communicate the result. You unit them back. Right? So that's something you could do. Right? Here, you need to broadcast S to multiple machines, which could be slow, but uh, Depends, depends on what the benefit they can get. So another thing is you can actually partition R and S on the same attribute. For example, you can partition R1 on A, S1 on A, right? In this case, this is an easy, this kind of easier case, right? On worker one, you only need to calculate R1 join S1. You don't need to have R1 join the whole S because I already partitioned on the right column, right? So I have a T2, right? So and then join the result. So since become a little bit tricky, if you, for example, uh, are partitioned on different columns, for example, you have R1 partition A, you have R2, uh, uh, sorry, I mean, uh, sorry, I mean, you have R partitioned on attribute A, and then you have S, for example, partitioned on another attribute. When that happens, if you look at your local table, right, you have R1, you have A1, 2, but here, because you are partitioned on different attributes, not on A, if you look at the A attributes, you could have something that's not in this R's range, right? So here, whenever you want to do join, you kind of need to uh, communicate. You cannot do this 100% in parallel, right? So here, I need to actually send S1 to worker two and to send S2 to worker one to make sure I have the whole range, right? Uh, and then I do the local join, and then I communicate. So as you can see, right? So distributed query op uh, optimization is a little bit tricky, right? It all depends on, I mean, you need to do the same exercise as we were doing for query, uh, for query optimization, right? But you need to consider the partition, right? So another dimension in the plan is actually when to communicate and what to communicate, right? So that actually makes the whole thing a little bit harder to do. But we are not going to go to the detail, just tell you the principle, uh, to make sure we will go to the real world, we will need distributed query processing, you know there's something there, okay? So another thing is about replication, right? So in the first half of the lecture, we actually get a very good question. Uh, someone asked, okay, what if the worker just don't get back to life, right? What if the whole, like, like, like someone smashed the worker, right? So what, what should we do, right? So in data center, Right, so that is something that you also need to consider. So you have a lot of machines, some of them will fail, and also some of the hard drive is going to fail, right? So that's always our assumption that hard drive is always there, but in practice, what if the hard drive fail, right? So in this case, you can need to replicate your data, and that is a functionality that the most of the distributed system are going to give you. So in this case, you also have different strategies to replicate your data, and each one of them has their pros and cons. So here's a very simple strategy. Assuming you have, for example, your data is partitioned into 32 pieces, P0, P1, P2, you have 32, your, like 32 pieces of your data. 
assuming you have four machines, okay? You have the yellow one, the blue machine, that each of this rectangle is a machine. One way to deal with replication is say, okay, um, I put all my information. So, so each machine have the primary copy. So machine one, I store information from P0 to P7, machine two, P8 to P15. But I also keep the, replica, uh, keep the replica of another machine. For example, I put all this information on machine one, replicate it on machine two. I have M0, M7, this is a replication. I have this, I, I, so I put all of this in machine two to machine three. I could do that, right? In this case, if machine one fail, just get all the picture. Someone just bring that away and never get back, uh, never get back to life. I can actually use the information on machine two to fully recover what you have in machine one, right? You can actually tolerate like a single machine failure, right? Of course, you need more replications to deal with more machine failures. It all depends on your guarantee to the user, your security guarantee. But this is not the only strategy, right? If you think about what could potentially be the downside of this, it is that if you have one machine fail, like so you know, this machine fail, the second machine need to deal with the workload that is two times larger than all the other machines, right? Because for this machine, I need to deal with my primary copy. And also I also need to deal with this small copy. Whenever you give me a query, the second machine is going to be two times slower than other machines, right? So that could be uh, something that we do not want. So there's different way you can deal with this. For example, you can do this like round robin type of way. For example, for every single machine, you have three primary copy P0 to P1. Instead of putting all the information of this machine to one single machine, you are going to put the P0 replicate on second machine, P1 on the third machine, P2 on the fourth machine. You do this kind of round robin type of way, okay? What's the benefit of this? The benefit of this is assuming there is a machine fail. For example, the first machine failed. You will not put all the workload to the second machine. So second machine going to deal with the replica M0. The third machine going to deal with M1. This one going to deal with M2, right? All of, if you have N workers and have one failure, right? all of them going to have one over N uh, more kind of workload. Right, so that could be something that uh, uh, that could be something that you want. So the the problem here is that it's very sensitive to the case that you have two machine fail, because whenever you have two machine failed, you can almost be guaranteed you are going to lose something. Right, for example, with the first machine fail, P zero, P one, P two is that gone, but I can recover them using my replica. But uh, what if I, uh, second machine also fail, then there's no machine holding M0, right? If the third machine fail, essentially whenever you have two machines fail, you are guaranteed to lose information, right? So if that is a property that you do not want, this is actually the downside of this, right? We are not going to go detail about replication, but just remember there's right, so many different strategies you can do like almost all the things we talk about in this course is all about trade-off, right? There's no free lunch, but when you design the system, try to think about the pros and the cons, right? And uh, just tailor them to your application. So now let's look at a distributed database in practice for you to get some feelings about what we are talking about here, okay? So here I have the database installed on this machine. So first one, uh, uh, it's not really distributed because there's only a single machine, but, but install multiple, essentially you can think about every single core as a worker. It, it doesn't really matter. Uh, if you think about what happened, right? So let's think about all the processes here. You can think about here, ah, this is all the processes that I'm running with the name Postgres, okay? So here, as you can see, there are so many different processes running this. If you're looking at what is running, so this is one worker. This is all the PostgreSQL processes listening to the port 6000. They are actually one worker, okay? And then this is another worker. You can see this a uh, whole bunch of PostgreSQL processes listening to the port uh, 6001. 
So that's actually another worker. They're all connected by the internet, uh, but not by, I mean, here by the shared memory, but, but doesn't matter. They have the kind of the, the network interface, okay? And then you have your master. The master listens to the port 5432, uh, right? So essentially you have one coordinator listening to this port, and you have two workers, one listening to this port, another listening to this port. And this is the thing that we are talking about. And as you can see, right? So even this database called Greenplum, uh, the name of the process is actually Postgres, <laughs> right? So they are actually running something very similar to PostgreSQL database on every single machine, right? And then you have a coordinator to, auto to actually coordinate. So there's no magic. This is a shared nothing architecture, right? So all the machines going to talk to each other via the network and within every single machine, it's almost a standing, it, 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 it's, it's almost like standalone database system. And you can connect to a database. So as we can see, there are, yeah, there are five relations. So there's one called the artist. If you find the tuple here, yeah. So it's the artist ID. This is the name of artist, so on and so forth. You have another relation called release by. Right, say, ah, this artist released this record. Okay, and you can actually uh, join them together, right? So you can say, ah, let's join artist and release by. Artist ID equals to. You can do this, you can do the join. So as you will see, there's one thing we need to really appreciate that is, as a user, I don't even know it's a distributed database. Whatever query you are running in PostgreSQL can also be run here. As a user, I don't have to know about the fact my data is actually distributed, okay? So that's the data transparency thing that I was talking about. So that's the design goal of such a system. But we can actually, Look at this in detail. If you look at this relation, the artist relation, if you get all the information using this, right? So I think you know how to do PostgreSQL, right? You can see there is all the columns, so on and so forth. But here there's a special thing called distributed by, right? This actually means that we, uh, I have a horizontal hash partition of this table. I have two workers, right? So one worker is storing some of the rows, another worker is storing some other set of the picture, okay? So I'm partitioning the whole thing by artist ID, okay? And then if you look at release by, you see, uh, release the by, sorry. You can see something similar, right? So this is a relation with two attributes. You have release by, you have artist. It's distributed by release ID, okay? So they're actually partitioned by different attributes. So if you see the query plan of the query that we have, you start to see interesting things. What could what would be the query plan look like? Like before we actually run this query, what would the query plan? I have an artist, I have a release by. I want to join them by artist ID. My artist table is partitioned by artist ID. My release by table is, is partitioned by another attribute. If I would coordinator have two choices, I would broadcast one relation to all the machines, and then I do the join locally, uh, and then I aggregate the result. The question, I don't know which table to broadcast. I would broadcast a smaller one, but I don't know which one's smaller, right? So if you run this query to explain it, you can see it's kind of a little bit different from your PostgreSQL query plot, right? So you'll have this thing called redistribution motion. So what it's actually trying to do is actually try to redistribute one relation. I think in this case, it's try to re redistribute the release by relation, hash it by artist ID, redistribute it to multiple machines. It, so, so it's, okay, so here's actually not broadcasting. So it's actually try to repartition the release by relation by artist ID and, the, and the actually send different copies, right, to different, uh, like machines. So after this point, if you look at your local table, I have my artist table, I have my release table, and they are now partitioned by the same attribute, which is artist ID. 
And then I do the local join. I do join locally, and then I gather all the information. Okay, so this is a query plan in a distributed database. And you can play with it. For example, uh, I can change how release by uh, is distributed. I can say, okay, I don't want to distribute by release ID anymore. I want to say, redistribute the table by artist ID. Okay, if you do this, if you look at release by relation, right? So you can say, ah, so now the relation is distributed by artist ID. If you look at the artist table, it's also distributed by artist ID. If I join these two relations together on artist ID, if you are query optimizer, what would you do? You will not redistribute anymore because they are already partitioned by the same attribute. So let's see whether that's the case or not. Right? As you can see, if you just explain the same table, uh, sorry, the same query, you do not have to redistribute anymore. You do local join. Each machine do join individually. Then you gather the result and that's it. Right? So I mean, this is just a very quick example for you to get a feeling. There are three things that uh, I think uh, you can remember. The first one is uh, there's no magic. If you really think about what's going on is you have multiple of those small database instances running as worker and they communicate. And for each one of them, they didn't even bother to change the name of the process, right? So it's still PostgreSQL. And the second thing is there are some notion of data transparency. That is, even if you have no idea how the data partitioned, right? So you can actually ask query as a user, right? As if it is a single database. The third thing is that how your data are actually partitioned have a very large impact on your final query plan. So when you are really building a distributed database system, you kind of need to think about what type of query you are going to support. And also try to think about how would you partition your data to make sure the query will be fast. So that's one caveat when you are using a distributed database system because you, you kind of not only need to design the schema, but you kind of need to design how the data should be partitioned to accommodate the query that you care about, okay? Which is not often an easy process. So this is about distributed database. Yeah, I know that we, we haven't go to detail, but just remember this is a functionality that you are able to use in reality in practice. Whenever you need it, go find it, okay? Okay, so we have another 23 minutes. So let's talk about another topic. It's about key value store, right? So for the whole semester, we call about SQL, right? So, and uh, you must hear something called NoSQL, right? So let's try to look at it. We are not going to go to detail, but just make sure you all know there's such a functionality. So essentially, if you think about NoSQL and key value store, right? So people always say uh, SQL versus NoSQL, right? So it's as if they are competitors, so you can only pick one over the other. Well, it's just another example of rethinking data management systems, given different assumptions, right? Like the whole course, right? Our whole course, all the things that we have been talking about is based on layers or layers of assumptions that we have on the workload. Given those assumptions, relational database is good. If you break some of the assumptions, maybe you should try something else. And it's as simple as that, right? So if you think about what we have so far, this is our view on data management. That is our data is going to start following some schema. Before you put data in the database, before I can manipulate them, I need to define my schema. What is table, what is constraint, right? So whenever I deal with the whole thing, I deal with a single tuple, right? Whenever I access my data, I have a high level declarative language, which is SQL based on relational algebra, right? Based on very de well-defined execution model. I have optimizer, right? To make sure the whole thing is declarative. I have transactions. I have automaticity, consistency, isolation, durability, right? Out of my transactions, whenever I organize data, I care about data replication. I deal with normal form, all those type of things. This is our way of dealing with data. 
And these are great, right? But at the end of the day, nothing is free because the moment you are getting the good thing out of the design, inherently you are paying something. For example, by enforcing the data, follow a certain schema, by just enforcing your high level declarative language, oh, you have a very well-defined interface, implementation could be efficient, you have a declarative language, it's all good. But on the other hand, you also constrain yourself on what type of operations you can do. I can only do those as aggregation, relational algebra, right? I cannot do other things, right? And then if you think about SQL and whatever programming language you were learning in previous years, they look very different, right? So sometimes there's a mismatch between SQL and something like Java and C++, right? So integration is not often the easy thing. And also when you talk about transactions, we give you a very strong guarantee on the correctness of front transactions, right? And we, we make sure everything is done by the database engine, not by the application. We make sure we have very defined property. But the moment you are doing that, it become expensive because you, I need to enforce a property, I need to do something with it, right? So you pay a cost uh, on concurrency, on availability, in throughput, response time. And sometimes when you have thousands of machines, it's not the easiest thing to scale, especially distributed transactions as we saw. So there's all those good things and bad things coming out of our design. But what if I don't care about those good things? That I really care about those bad things. If you are asking these type of questions, then you are going to get yourself a different data table systems. And that system, if you build from scratch, given the thing that you really cares about, it's going to give you a different type of system. There's no good or bad. They are all consequence of the assumption you have. But given the assumption, there is good or bad. If you assume in your application, you don't need all those good things provided by the relational database system, then of course, then you should build a different type of system to be faster, be more scalable, but you lose some of the guarantee you have. And that's gave us the key value store, right? So which is actually one exercise people are doing actually when I started my PhD, it's really hot, it's like 10 years ago, right? So people start to rethinking about how to build a data system if I do not care a lot of things that you see on the right-hand side. So the head of idea is let's get rid of everything, okay? So let's just, I don't want schema, I don't want declarative language, I don't want transactions, okay? Let's get rid of everything. So. I can only support two operations. I can get and I can set. It's the whole thing is a hash table, right? So I can get a key. I can set a value for a key. That's it, that's all I can do. I don't have transactions, right? So there's some notion called eventual consistency. It's a weaker notion of consistency, right? And potentially there's no transactions. I don't, I don't care. I can only get and set. That, that's all I do. So the hope of doing that it's by relaxing all those constraints, you can scale better and become faster because we don't need to support all those complex things that we talk about. And also hopefully, which is the key, is to ensure high availability in distributed systems. That is when you have thousands of machines hosting the same database, I want to make sure I can tolerate a larger amount of machine failures such that I can still serve my user. Right? Think about your Amazon, you are building kind of the, the e-commerce platform, right? You want to make sure people are able to buy things no matter how many machines is done, right? I want to make sure I can have duplication in the data center level, right? So, and that is my hope. By relaxing the guarantee and providing to the user, this is what I want to happen. So, but as simple as it is, it always have a data model. So data model here is a key value store. I have keys, I have values, and I have an index on my key. That's it, okay? So the distributed uh, is kind of deployed in a distributed way. You have multiple machines, 
you do horizontal partition on the key. Whenever someone wants to look at the key, like get the key, you find the right machine, serve it. When someone wants to set a key, right, update the value of the key, you find the right machine and get it. I have replication of the partitions, that like each partition is being replicated on multiple machines to make sure if this machine is down, I can also find information somewhere else. Okay. So of course there are different replication strategies, right? You can ask for a quorum or whatever. You can have asynchronous replication. There are so many different things. Yeah, once you know what you are trying to build, you can revisit the exercise that we have been doing for relational database to rethink about all the other design decisions. So let's look at just one quick example, right? So this is actually one key value store actually that you can use today uh, on Amazon, right? So you can create a table. I say test table, I give a name, right? So you'll say uh, there's a key. I say this is my key, okay? And then create a table. And now I have a table, okay? And then there's not that much you can do. So let's think about what to do. Okay, so you can create an item. But then you can say, okay, let me insert this. My key is five. And uh, I'm going to append a value uh, is whatever. Okay, we don't care. You can put whatever there is. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a binary chunk of data. Okay. I save it. And then in my table, I have this. And I can keep doing this. I have key in cost 87. I have my value. I don't even need to have a schema, right? I can put whatever there, okay? As you can see, now I have a very weird table, right? I have one, <laughs> one, one item with a key five, only have value. I have another item 87 with whatever, right? So, and then I can query them. I can query my data. I can say, okay, I can get a key. Let's see what happens if I have key equals nine. I search it, I find nothing in the database. Okay, what if my key is five? I find this one. Yeah, I can get, I can set. That's all I can do, right? Of course, you can scan the table, right? You can scan all the tuples, whatever. So this is actually a key value store, right? So as you can see, it has a very simple interface. The good thing is it's very simple. So potentially I can really go crazy in making it scalable. But downside is it's, it's simple. There's only that much things you can do, right? So that's the pros and cons. So again, the good thing is it's very fast to look up because the whole thing is a distributed hash table, right? It's very easy to scale to many machines because it's so simple. Uh, it's useful in many applications. So that's the key. Right, we simplify the whole thing, but still useful. Right, so that is the key. The bad thing is if you do not, if your query doesn't fit into get and set, I mean, I don't know what to do. Right, I need to scan the whole thing. Uh, if I want to do range query, it's very slow. Right, if I want to do range query on keys. What can I do? I don't even know. Right, if I want to join, well, you need to implement that by yourself. Right, unfortunately, all those query optimization stuff we have been looking at. Well, you need to do that all, all by yourself because my database doesn't support it anymore. So if you have queries on the attribute, on the value, well, that's also a little bit hard because there's no attributes, right? I don't interpret the value. So and often data is inconsistent across different replicas, but you need to deal with that when you, when you, when you, when you build applications, right? So, and also the ugly side, right? So it kind of push the complexity and the responsibility to applications, right? So at the end of the day, right? There's no magic, someone to pay the price, someone to deal with the complexity. Either the database do that for you or you as someone building applications pay for the complexity. And there's no right answer. Maybe it is the right thing to do for application to build, to, 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 to deal with complexity because application knows about more information than the database, right? But maybe it's the other way around, who knows, right? It's all dependent on, on your application. But at the end of the day, what's need to be paid is going to be paid. The question is where is going to be paid in the system? When it will be paid also by whom, okay? 
And some operations are very costly to implement, range query, join, right? So it, but it worked well for what it, 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 it is designed for, doesn't work well for other scenarios, right? So it's not a replacement for database, but uh, for the application designed for, it's amazing, okay? Okay, so we have 10 minutes. Let's go through a very simple design decision that people are making here. So that is, okay, if you want to build such a distributed hash table, what would you do? Oh, single machine, that's, that's kind of easy, right? I have an in-memory hash table. Whenever you want to get a key, I look at the hash table return. Whenever you put a key, I put that key into the hash table, done. So the whole thing becomes interesting when you have multiple machines, when you want to partition this table. So the hope is we pay so much on data model and the functionality is it's better, easier to build a distributed system. As we will see, it's actually easier to build. So how can you do hash table over multiple machines? So here we are going to talk, so, talk about something called consistent hashing. So here's a high level idea. I have a huge hash table. Here I have a hash table with five different keys. And for each key, I have the hash value, okay? And uh, I have three machines, machine zero, machine one, machine two. Now the fundamental question I want to ask is how should I partition this table to these three machines? A naive strategy would be, okay, so I do the hash value of mode three, and then I just take that as my, my machine ID. For example, I will take all the, tuples where hash mode three is zero, I put that on machine zero. I do this for machine one, I do this for machine two, I have a partition of my data. Whenever someone gave me a key, I hash it, find the right machine, return the answer. So this is a naive strategy. And that's actually what, like uh, if you look at database, that's actually when you do hash partition, this is what happened in at least on, uh, on textbook, right? So in real system, a little bit, there's caveat. But yeah, this is a natural thing to do, right? Not that crazy, right? It's, it's very natural. But what's the problem? The problem happens when you imagine some machine decide to leave. So here we are talking about some machine leave. It, it's, it's not some machine fail. It, 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 it's that some machine say, okay, I don't want to work on this anymore. I leave, I give you time to do mitigation, okay? So, so, so it's not some machine just crash. Some machine decide to leave. In this case, what would happen if you do this strategy? How much data do you need to mitigate from machine two to other machines? In this case, the problem is that if you take this view, that is your partition is based on hash mode N, where N is number of machines, you are going to have a lot of data movement because if you compare hash mode three and hash mode two, right? Even if only machine two left, you are going to have a case where you need to move shuffle data from machine one to machine zero, simply because that's a property of your hash value, right? So, and that is actually the problem here. When you are building a system that machine join, machine leave periodically, if you just take this naive view about how to do hash partition, it might not be the best strategy because whenever a new machine joins the cluster, you end up reshuffling your whole database. And that is something we want to avoid. So how can we do that? So there's something very interesting called consistent hashing. And the high level idea is instead of, shuff, uh, instead of hashing your data only, let's hash both the machine and the data. And then I can have certain consistency between my machine and my, and my data. So essentially I'm thinking about the whole range of all the hash value as a ring. Okay, so this is all my hash values. And then of course I can put all those keys on the ring. Now each one of them corresponding to their, like, to their own hash value. And I also put my machine also on the ring. And my protocol is 
if you run that in a clockwise direction, one machine only deal with all the tuples that are being hashed to the interval in a clockwise way between this machine and my next machine. For example, here, Bill and Steve, right, belongs to machine C, Kate belongs to machine B, John and Jen belongs to machine A. That's my protocol. So this is actually very interesting because if you think, okay, so what if machine A leaves the cluster? This guy leaves. What do I need to do, right? In this case, all I need to do is to give B all of these tuples, right? And if you think about the responsibility, uh, the responsibility of C, it actually doesn't change. You will not have this reshuffling problem, right? Because the, the, the interval that C deal with doesn't change. It always deals with the interval between C between B and C, right? When A leave, you, you get whatever the old workload from A to B, and that's it. Right? Actually it makes sense. You will have K machine, uh, you will have K data points and N machines. The amount of data shuffling you are going to have when some machine leave the cluster is actually K over N. Right? It's much better than what we saw before. What if a new machine join the cluster? Assuming now we have a new cluster D, uh, uh, like new machine D joining the cluster. Again, I, sh I, 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 I hash the machine D, put that on a ring, and then I, I give John to D, and then I give John to A. In this case, the responsibility of B and C will not change. So that is actually the beauty of this. But what could be the potential problem for this strategy? Well, there are a lot of those, but uh, one of them is if you think about load balancing, it's actually not the best thing in the world. Because if you think about this strategy, right? In expectation, the workload on machine A and machine D will be two times less than machine B and C. Right, B and C in expectation is taking two times more workload than A and D because when D joins between A and C, I actually give all the workload of A to D, but B and C doesn't change, right? So essentially you have more load on B and C. So how can you deal with that? Well, there are so many different ways, right? So one way uh, is that you partition each node into a whole bunch of virtual node. Instead of treating A as a machine, you treat that as 10 machines, 10 workers, 10 virtual nodes. You do same thing for B, you do same thing for C, and you rerun this protocol as if you have 30 machines. If you do this, right, so you can actually have a very good load, I mean, not very good, but more reasonable load balancing, you, can, you, you could do better, right? But uh, you can have better load balancing compared with treating each machine as a machine, okay? Of course, it's going to cause problem. We'll try to do replication, but uh, there's no free lunch. And of course, what if machine crashes? So here is different from machine draw and leave because it doesn't give you time to do data redistribution. Some machine crashes. Well, in this case, once you can do uh, is you can do data replication. For example, this is my hash ring, right? So for this machine A, right, to deal with this range, but I also replicate the next, for example, two ranges. I also replicate C here, I also replicate B. For this data range is D, I replicate B, replicate A, right? I also go to in the gamma interval afterwards. In this example, gamma equals three, right? So essentially I just take the next R, the gamma minus one node in the clockwise direction and I replicate that. So that could be an interesting strategy. How can you guarantee consistency among replicas, right? Kind of not trivial uh, because when you have replications, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's getting messy, right? So we are not going to go detailed here, but in principle is when you have N machines, uh, sorry, that we have N replica of your data, right? So you are dealing with a trade-off between how many workers I need to block when I do an update and also how many replica I need to read for each request. But in principle, as long as these two numbers, R and W, sum together larger than N is fine. For example, you, you have N replica of data. Whenever I'm trying to read something, 
I make sure all the N machines are getting updated. If you do that, whenever I whenever you read something, you only to read a single replica. But if your uh, strategy say, okay, I have N replica, whenever I update something, I only guarantee one machine receive my update and all the other machine can propagate whatever. If you do that, whenever you read something, you need to read all the replica because you don't know which one get updated, right? So, but as long as W plus R, these two numbers larger than the total number replica, you are fine. So we are not going to detail, right? But if you, there's only one thing you remember is relational database architecture we have been talking about for the whole course is not a universally right answer of data processing. It's a very good answer for many things, but it's not a universally right answer. So given different workload assumptions, you have different cost benefit analysis, you have the price that you want to pay, you have the price that you cannot pay, right? So that's going to give you very different system designs. And that's give you essentially different between relational database to key value store or to other type of data systems. That gives you a difference between SQL and non-SQL, right? It's all the consequence given different assumptions of your workload and given different type of prices that you are willing to pay. So that's all for today. Right, so starting from the beginning of semester until today, right, we talk about essentially what people are doing for 50 years, right? So next lecture, we are going to talk about what I did, right? So I'm going to give you a very biased view about some research topics in modern data research and goal is really try to make sure you understand, okay, database can do a lot of things. It's a very old area, but there are some fascinating research that other people are doing in the last 10 years, and also a little bit from ourselves, right? Not as fascinating, but a little bit of work. Uh, to make sure you see this is a very active research area, a lot of things that can be done. And maybe some of you decide, ah, this is something I'll spend the rest of my life on, maybe, right? So yeah, so that's all for today. If you have any questions, I'll be here to answer them. Otherwise, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Yeah, so if you have any questions, let's speak up. Um, I have just one quick question. Yeah, go ahead. You, uh, you're gonna discuss it, but uh, for now, I saw our website and uh, I've seen that uh, we are gonna maybe have a computer-based exam. Um, in this case, um, are we are going to have the access to the Kana, Kana Kota environment or uh, you know? No, no. So you will not have a running database system. Yeah. Uh -huh, okay. So a computer-based um, exam is just uh, like um, multiple choice questions and stuff like that. The majority will be multiple choice. Uh, I think so. Yeah. So, 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 so from last year, I think uh, they are all multiple choice. Uh, yeah. Maybe there's some small change this year, but it will not be too different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just to make sure that because I don't know how to use uh, Katakon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, like, you do not need a running database system. Yeah. So, we are going to read and write SQL query on paper. Yeah. Yep. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, and sure. have a nice day. Bye. You too. Bye. Okay, so if there's no other questions, I'll see you guys on Wednesday.